blessed be you. Amen. I want you to turn this morning in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. This is a different message than you might expect to hear. If we like to preach about healing and miracles and signs and wonders. But I've entitled the message today, If You Can't Run With The Big Dogs, Stay On The Porch. <laughs> Amen? If you can't run with the big dogs, stay on the porch. Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, and Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them. Yea, they have taken root, they grow. Yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and had tried my heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed and the birds because they said, He shall not see our last end. Verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace, Wherein thou trusted they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? Father, I need your divine enablement in order to effectively share a word that needs to be delivered. God, I pray, Lord, that the ears of the hearer would be receptive, but the heart would be prepared. God, I pray, Lord, that the seed would take root in fertile soil. I pray that it would not fall on stony ground, on dry ground. But I pray today, Lord, it would be a word in due season. Somebody struggling, somebody suffering, somebody that's battling the enemy. I pray today would find sweet victory, Lord, not only over the obstacles, but in the midst of the trial. God, I pray today, Lord, this word would change somebody's outlook and alter someone's attitude. And I pray, God, it would begin to transform somebody's life. Have your way, Lord, and may your word not return void or come back empty, but let it accomplish everything that you, O Holy Spirit, desire it to accomplish. Make it come alive. Make it become real. Make it become life in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The name Jeremiah simply means God appoints. How many know that God gives you your assignment. Yeah. And Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4 reveals that God had a specific assignment for Jeremiah even before his birth. And the ministry that was assigned to this man was not a ministry of glamour or glory. He was not called to prophesy prosperity. <laughs> he did not have a Mercedes ministry. Diamonds did not decorate his fingers and Rolexes would not dangle from his wrist. His message was far from seeker sensitive. He proclaimed a rebuke, not reward. He proclaimed defeat, not victory. He, he proclaimed captivity, not liberty. Doesn't sound like a man of God, does it? A man of God should be preaching victory and prosperity and reward and freedom. But Jeremiah came along preaching defeat, bondage, and slavery. And as you might imagine, his prophecies were far from popular. They were on um, the top ten most popular messages received. They, if you went on YouTube, they probably wouldn't have very many views. <laughs> In chapter 11, the chapter prior to the reading of our text today, God begins to reveal to Jeremiah a plot by the people from Anathoth, which 
which happened to be his own hometown, in which they plotted and planned to kill him. That sounds like a ministry we all want to sign up for. <laughs> Somebody's out to kill you. Can I tell you a little secret? Whether you realize it or not, you've already signed up for that ministry because somebody is out to kill you. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. And if you think that you are not going to have somebody stalking you, you better think again. Satan has put a target on your heart, not on your back. He's put it on your heart and he wants to steal your treasure. He wants to pervert your, your thoughts and he wants you to give up on God. And now Jeremiah hears about those in his own hometown that want to kill him. And we get to our text in chapter 12, and there's a dialogue between Jeremiah and Jehovah. And we're going to examine three aspects of the conversation from Jeremiah's perspective, and then we're going to see it from Jehovah's perspective. Three simple points today when you are facing trials that are bigger than you are. When you are facing tribulation that you cannot endure without somebody to hold your hand and carry you through. There are three specific truths that we're going to deal with. Number one, we're going to talk about what Jeremiah knew. He says in our text right off the bat, the first sentence, Righteous art thou, O Lord. As you serve God, you need to know that God is righteous. Amen. Do you know what it means by righteous? It means He does the right thing. Yeah. He doesn't always do your thing. Because your thing is not always the right thing. My thing is not always the right thing. It's usually the convenient and the comfortable thing, but not the most uh, beneficial thing. Because the easy way is not always the best way. Sometimes the easy way gets you in more trouble and more heartache than the difficult path. But Jeremiah knew that God was a righteous God, that God would get him through. Amen? In Psalm 18 and verse 30, the psalmist says, As for God, His way is perfect. Amen? The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. In Psalm 119, 137, Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Psalm 145 and 17, The Lord is righteous in all of His ways, and holy in all of His works. When Lot went down to Sodom, and he began to sojourn in the land of Sodom. Sin began to run rampant. We know how Abraham and Lot had traveled together and both had increased in herds and in, in cattle and in sheep. And now there came strife between Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen. And although Abraham was the main man, he was the big cheese. He told Lot, you choose which land you want to go to. We need to separate not be divided, but we need some space so that we don't become divided. And so he said, you choose the land you want. And Lot looked and he saw the beautiful plains down where Sodom was and how, how uh, good the land was and it was fruitful and it was just a beautiful place. And Lot said, I'll take the good spot. Isn't that the way self works? I want the best for me. Abraham could have said, I'm sending you over here, buddy. And Lot wouldn't have had a say. But because Abraham was a man of God, he said, you choose. And Lot chose what looked good. I want to tell you, all the glitters is not gold. Come on, come on. Everything that looks good is not good. And you need to make sure the decisions you make are godly decisions and not selfish decisions, or you will often regret the decisions you make and when, when they go down to this land of plenty and they go down to this beautiful spot. Self is just increased and that attitude of selfishness and greed just continues to escalate and now they want to free self and they get into sin and now they become to the place where they don't regard God and their knowledge and sin runs rapid. And they begin to do that which God has said they should not do. 
And God's had enough and he tells why I'm going to destroy the city. And as we go back into Genesis chapter 18, Lot begins to reason with God. And he says this, he says, Are you going to cause the righteous to suffer along with the wicked? Would you spare the city if there's 50 righteous people in this city? He starts bargaining with God. Amen. Amen. And you know, he said, and then he says this, he said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God said, I will be right. He said, if there's 50 righteous, I'll spare the city. But guess what? There are 50 righteous people in this place. How about 45? I, I, I'd still do it for 45, but you don't have 45 that are righteous in this place. How about 40? I mean, I mean this guy's bargaining. This guy's really dickering. I mean, he's, he, you think he's buying a used car. How about 40? Yeah, but there's not 40 righteous. Went down 30, 20, and finally 10. And God said there's not even 10 righteous. Therefore, I have to destroy this city. And we know how God had to destroy it. it didn't, you know, we would have thought, well, God could have done whatever he had to do to bring it about and make it so holy and righteous. But he gave us a free will. That's right. And the right thing is not always the popular thing. Arguing over me yesterday, we were seated together. He says, I remember what you said many times. He said, I've relied on that, and it's not important to have a new start, but you have to have a right start. Yeah, yeah, Can I tell you, you don't have to do a new thing, you have to do the right thing. Yeah, amen. 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 Shall not the judge of the earth do right? And here in our text, the one thing that Jeremiah knew when he's got a city of friends and family and those that should love him and care for him, plotting to kill him, and you think you got it tough. Is your family plotting your murder? I mean, they were literally, they weren't going to just assassinate his character. They were going to take his life, and they weren't going to do it in a pleasant way. But he said, God, won't you do what? He says, you are righteous. You are a God of purity and holiness. And I tell you something, Calvary was not fair. But it was just. It wasn't fair for Jesus in innocence to pay for our sin and our guilt. He done nothing wrong, but it was just because man couldn't pay the price that he owed for the sin that Adam had committed. Only Jesus could afford to pay that price. He was the spotless, sinless lamb that had to be slain from the foundation of the world. And although it was not fair, it was just. You know, we live in a day where we think everything's got to be fair. Can I tell you, life is not fair and God is not always fair. He is always just and right. not fair that God sends people to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He died on the cross to keep you from hell. You choose to go there by rejecting what he provided to get you out of there. He did the right thing. He's a righteous God. And when you're going through trials and hard times, you need to understand that God will always do the right thing. When you wonder what you need to know is God, you do it right. You do it right. Second thing that he knew was this. He said, the Lord, you know me. You've seen me. You have tried my heart toward me. He said, I know that you know who I am. The second thing you need to know to accept the things you don't know in order to deal with the things you can't understand, there's one thing you must understand, and that is the fact not only is God righteous, but God knows you. And God has called you. If you know that He knows you, if you know that He's called you, then whatever you're going through, you can get through. Hallelujah. In John chapter 10 and verse 14, it says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. In day of one seven, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. In 2 Timothy 2.19, nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 
6, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. You know what it is to search. It means to seek. It means to put all your attention on looking for one particular item. You know what I mean when you drop that item down the cushion of your recliner chair at home and it's a comfortable seat, but you need what you just dropped, and so you get up. Turn around and reach down into the cushion, and to your astonishment, you pull out something that you don't need right now, but you needed last week. <laughs> I could have used you then, but since I found you now, I'll put you away where I'll have you when I need you later. You reach back down because you're looking for something that you need immediately, and this is not immediate, but it's interesting. How many know that you're more than interesting God? to God? You are immediate to Him. How many know that the economy of America is interesting to him, but you're immediate to him? Amen? To search for means to focus all your attention on, and you search that cushion until you find what you lost. God has searched you. He's put everything else on the back burner to focus attention on you. Do you understand how much he loves you? He, he has searched you to the place where every hair on your head is numbered, and even if it's only stubble. <laughs> He has searched me and known me. You know my time sitting. You know my uprising. You know when I'm mad. You know when I'm glad. You know when I'm bad. You know when I'm sad. You, you know when I'm up. You know when I'm down. You know when I'm on top of the world. You know when I'm under the under the gun. You know when things are good and you know when things are bad. You know my down sitting. You know my uprising. You understand my thoughts are far off and. I've shared this before, but how interesting it is. I, every time I read this passage, it comes back to me. How often do we not even know our thoughts? It doesn't say he knows your thoughts before you think your thoughts. It says he understands your thoughts afar off. He understands your thoughts before you even think of them. I don't understand them after I think them. Have you ever said, what on earth was I thinking? But God understands your thoughts before you even think those thoughts. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Before I formulate the phrase that I'm about to speak into the atmosphere that comes from my inward being into the outward air around me and into the ear of the one that would hear. Oh, there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. You know what I'm going to say before I speak. You know what I'm going to utter before I declare. Amen? Oh, there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before. You know what I look like from the back side as well as the front side. Amen? I told you about the lady who her and her husband had an agreement that they wouldn't spend more than $100 without checking with one another first. She came home with a $500 dress, and he came home and said, we have an agreement. She said, yes, but when I tried it on, the devil said, that looks good. He said, you're to say, get me behind me, Satan. She said, I did. He said, it looks good from this angle, too. <laughs> you have beset me behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. You didn't distance yourself from me. You hooked up. You connected. You made contact. You got up close and personal. You weren't ashamed of me. You weren't embarrassed by me running behind me so no one would see you were with me. But you touched me, connected with me. You got together with me. Hallelujah. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. Let me tell you something. You need to understand one thing. Whatever you're going through today, God knows you. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you're battling through. He knew Jeremiah. He knew everything there was to know about Jeremiah. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. Don't think you're hiding from God. God will 
knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. Remember Joseph? God gave Joseph a dream when he was a little boy. And he showed Joseph the sun and the moon and the eleven stars that were worshiping him. And the eleven sheep bowing in the sheep. And he was telling Joseph through dreams, I'm going to make you a great leader. He's just a kid. How's he going to be a great leader? But Joseph understood that. His father had picked him as the favorite son and given him a coat of many colors. And his brothers were jealous. And then when he went and shared his dream with his brothers, they had enough and they beat him up, put him in a pit, sold him into slavery, and dumped him out on the side of the road and said, Get out of Dodge, buddy. Don't come back. So now he's not with his family, he's not the favorite son, now he's a slave. And where he had great freedom, now he is in bondage. How does that have anything to do with leadership? God, you don't know anything about what I'm going through because you told me I'd be a leader and now my life is messed up. But he did the right thing in a difficult place and he stood for righteousness and when pursued by Potiphar's wife, he rejected and he refused her advances and he kept his integrity intact and he ran from her when she tried to make a play for him. And when he ran, she grabbed his coat and tore it off him and he left the coat there. But when her husband came home because she was angry that he would not yield to her temptation, she told her husband that he had forced himself on her and showed the coat. And now Joseph in his integrity ends up in prison falsely accused. What does that have to do with leadership? God, you don't know what's going on. Can you picture, Joe? This was 13 years, by the way. Can you look into the prison with me about 12 years into this? <coughs> leadership. Is that what you call this? What am I leading? The rat on the by, the snake slithering past. Spider making a web over my head. What, what, what am I leading? I stood for righteousness and look where I'm at. God, you told me that I had potential and that I would reach that place that you had for me. You really know me, don't you? You don't know a thing that's going on. My life is messed up. Where are you when I need you? Come on, I'll tell you, all right? You ever said these things? Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. How come my life is going to hell in a hurry and in a handbasket? And how come you're never around to pull me out when I need you to help me out? You don't know anything about me, God. You don't understand what I'm going through because if you really understood, you wouldn't let me go through this. Well, really. Right? Come on, tell it. He knows what you need, not what you want. And maybe you need to go through that because you're a little arrogant like Joseph was. He was a little cocky, a little proud. He never should have bragged to his brothers about the dream God gave him. He should have shut his mouth. But he had a little arrogance in him. God had to humble him. And what better place to humble him than to put him in a pit? <laughs> That'll bring you down. Right. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and why, why Potiphar's house? Why slavery? Why did he have to go there? Well, because... God had prepared a place for him to manage the goods of the nation. He had to learn how to manage the goods of the estate first. In the Potiphar's house, he learned to manage the estate before he could ever learn to manage the country. What does prison have to do with it? Well, was it not in the prison that he met the king's cupbearer and the baker? It was the meeting with the cupbearer that got an audience with the king and never would have met the king as a slave. Had he not met the cupbearer and used his dream interpretation giftings in order to gain some influence to get him where he ought to go, he, God, God put him in prison because he had to be in the right place to make the right contact. Amen. You don't think prison's the right place? Maybe God will put you there and you'll find out and that's where you need. <laughs> Joseph didn't go there because he did something wrong, though. He didn't put himself in prison. God positioned him there. There's a difference. Don't get yourself in trouble and then say, oh God, you're using this. You got yourself in trouble, you're paying the price, you're reaping what you sow. 
with God, which there is a different story, but God knew what was going on in Joseph's life, and he knew Joe needed to be humble. He knew Joe needed to how to learn how to manage some goods, and he knew that Joe needed to get an audience with the king in order to get a position, and God knew all about Joseph when Joseph didn't think God knew anything about him, but what you need to know when you're going through hell on earth is you need to know that God knows you. You need to know that God does all things well, that He's a righteous God. Sometimes, I've shared before, but sometimes the only thing that sustains me in ministry is the call of God on my life as a boy. It would be easy to walk away so many times when it gets difficult and struggles come. And whatever you're going through, it gets easy to leave it behind and let it go. But it's that call that says, God, you know me. You know me. You explained it to me before I ever started this journey. You laid it out before me. You already explained it in detail. And God, you know where I'm at right now. And when I know that you do things right and I know that you know where I am, Sometimes it's only the call of God that keeps you on track. You have to know and not just feel that you're in the center of God's will. And sometimes God's will is not comfortable. No. Jeremiah knew that he was prophesying God's will, even though it was not an easy message to deliver. He said, to God, he said, oh Lord, you know me, and you've seen me, and you've tried my heart. You know that my heart is pure. You've looked at this, and I know that I'm in the center of your will. His motive was to obey God, even when it contradicted his own will. Can I just ask you to ask yourself one question? When you're going through difficult things, have you prayed about it? Do you know it's the will of God? Do you know it's what God wants for you? You see, Jeremiah knew that God did the right thing, and he knew that his call came from God, and God knew right where he was. And when you know those two things, it will carry you through the plot to kill you and annihilate you. That's what he knew. But the second thing we look at is what he didn't know. He says here in verse 4, How long shall the land mourn? And the hearts of every field wither. For the wickedness of them that dwell therein, the beasts are consumed in the birds, because they have said, He shall not see our last end. Actually, right back in verse 1, he says this. He said, Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal treacherously? You see, what he knew was God was right. He knew that God knew where he was, and God knew who he was, and God knew what was going on. But what he didn't know is if God is so righteous, then why do the heathen prosper? You ever feel that way? No good deed goes unpunished. Every time I do the right thing, I get the wrong result. And those who do the wrong thing seem to get the right result. How come that bum gets blessed? How come that jerk? That idiot. How come God allows him to prosper? He's not even serving God. And look what I'm suffering with. I'm, he did not know. Why do those that do the wrong thing get the right result? He had a hard time processing this information. He's not alone. Job felt that same way in Job chapter 2. In verse 7, or 21, rather, in verse 7, Job 21, 7, Wherefore, Job said, do the wicked live, become old, yea, our mighty in power. How come the wicked people seem to get ahead in life? You said cheaters don't prosper, and yet you see cheaters seemingly prospering? You just don't understand what it means to prosper. Prosper doesn't mean to get rich. The word prosper in the original Greek means to help along one's way or journey. And those that get rich sometimes need more help along the journey because they're committing suicide. They're taking their lives. Their homes are falling apart. Their whole life is messed up. They're not prospering. Oh, they may be affluent in the material goods, but they're not prospering. May you be in health and prosper as your 
soul prospers. It's what's on the inside, not the outside. Psalm 37, verse 7, David, the psalmist said, Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Here's David saying, don't look at the guy who's doing the wrong thing, getting the wrong, wrong results. Don't get frustrated over those that seem to get blessed when you're broke. You're doing the right thing. They're doing the wrong thing. They get what seems to be the right result, and you don't. Asaph, the psalmist, said, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble like other men, neither are they plagued like other men. But if you read on in that psalm, he says, But then I came to the house of God and saw the end. And at the end, it did all ironed out. They might have prospered on earth, but they lost out in eternity. And if I suffer with him, I'm going to reign with him. And even though I may not be getting what others are getting on earth, I'm going to have an eternal reward that will outshine and outweigh anything they've accrued. Anathoth was a city of priests, and yet they were hypocrites. Here's what Jeremiah is saying. He's saying, and listen to me, I want you to hear this. He's saying, why does seemingly hypocrisy, seeming hypocrisy, why is it tolerated in the church? Why does a pastor deal with this guy or that woman? Why does he go out and look at them? Though? You ever ask yourself, why is sin tolerated in the church? I'll tell you a little secret. The Bible said you let the wheat and the tear grow together. And at the end, he'll separate the wheat from the chaff. Whether they're growing and they're intermingled and they're intertwined, if you go pulling, you're going to pull the plant out, not just the weed. If they're that close together, sometimes you've got to keep your hands off it. Keep your mouth silent. And let God deal with it. It's not being tolerated in the church. It's not being promoted in the church. God will take care of it. And in the end, you see, our problem is that we live in the light of the temporary. But God deals in the light of eternity. Why do the heathen prosper? Why is hypocrisy tolerated in the church? Sometimes you have got to let the wheat and the tear grow together until God can sort it out because they are so tight together that the roots are intertwined and when you pull the weed, you're pulling the plant. Unless that weed is so far distinctly separated from the plant, then you can deal with it. But when it's tied up together with a good, healthy plant, you can't be pulling that weed unless you mess up the plant. God will take care of that. Amen. And Jeremiah is saying, look, these guys are out to kill me. I'm preaching your word. I'm delivering your message. Why aren't you dealing with that? How come you're letting them come against me the way you are? How come things are so bad for me, so good for them? That's not fair, God. That's not right. That's not righteous. Why do they get moving forward? I'm the one that's not backward. Oh, come on, church. I'm preaching to a few people here. yourself with somebody else. God will deal with the evildoers in his time. But you've got to understand that our time is temporary and his is eternal. God will deal with them. You see, what Jeremiah knew was he knew God was righteous and did the right thing. He knew that he was in God's will and God knew where he was. What he didn't know is why did seeming hypocrisy Continue without being dealt with. Why did the heathen get blessed when the prophet of God was seemingly cursed? But here's what he needed to know. We talked about what he knew, what he didn't know, but here's what he needed to know. Verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusted they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? First thing here that we deal with that he needed to know was this. 
God's will and you don't know why that God's blessing is not on your life, you're not seeing the fruit to your harvest, you're not seeing the results you want, people are coming against you, they're maligning you, they're assassinating your character and even trying to harm your body and, and you're wondering why is God allowing this and why do I go through this? You need to understand, number one, it's not about everybody else, it's only about you. Seems like I've shared that somewhere earlier today. The question is not, listen to me, the question is not, what is God doing? Want me to say that again? The question is not, what is God doing? The question is, how am I responding? The question is not, what is God allowing? Because He does the right thing every time. And you know that from the start. You are a righteous God. So if I know that you are doing the right thing, the question is not, what are you doing? The question is, how am I responding? God's Word is not a window to look out through, but a mirror to look into. He that beholds his face in the glass is like he that looks into the law of liberty. Bitterness enters when the focus is on others and not on self. We don't need to be selfish where we focus on what we don't get and what we ought to get. But we need to focus on self when it comes to our behavior. Don't focus on yourself when it comes to blessing, but focus on yourself when it comes to behavior. Right. It's not what God's doing, it's how am I responding? What am I doing with what God is allowing? You see, the prodigal never found satisfaction until he came to himself. You'll never get where God wants you to be if you keep looking at everybody else and saying, how come they're getting away with it? How come they're being blessed? They're doing the wrong thing. I'm doing the right thing. God, this is messed up. Get your eyes off of somebody else and turn your eyes upon Jesus. Don't compare yourself with them. Compare yourself to Him and see how you measure up. We like to justify ourselves. We heard about the two guys being chased by a bear, and the one guy said, I don't have to be fast, just faster than you. I don't have to be good, just better than you. That's what we think. No, don't you compare yourself concerning the blessing, but you concern and you consider yourself concerning the behavior. Jeremiah, it's not about the prophets in Anathoth. It's not about those plotting against you. It's not about those evil people that are prospering. It is about you. If you can't keep up with a footman, how are you going to ever keep up with the horses? If you got weary over here, how are you ever going to
another one, it was another difficult spot. My brother was talking to me one day, he says, hey Joe, how come you always get to tough places? I said, God doesn't use the warriors in difficult assignments. Why do I have to go through what I go through? Because God does not use weak Christians for difficult assignments. You need to understand God's trusting you with this work. God is trusting you where he puts you. Like Job, he said, if you considered him, there's not like him. You can do anything you want to him and he'll still serve me. He'll still trust me. He'll still obey me. He'll still, I'll put my faith in that old boy. You see, things are going to get a little bit difficult because God calls strong men and women to fulfill difficult assignments. In Luke chapter number 12 and verse 48, it says, To whom much is given of him shall much be required. If God's given you a gift, he wants to get back from you what he's invested in you. Amen? If you put money in the bank, you want to get your money back, and then some, right? God wants to get back from his investment. He wants to get a good return out of your life. And if you have been given giftings, God will use them. Look at Elijah, man. Do you think he had an easy assignment? You walk into the king, buddy. Just walk in there out of the blue and just tell him it's not going to rain until you say it's going to rain. <laughs> Who? Me? Yeah, you. Just go out there and tell him what I tell you to tell him. Then go down to the brook. I don't want you around anybody. I'm going to isolate you. I'm going to cut you off from anything because... He went to the brook Cherith, which is Hebrew word Kareth means cutting away. The first thing God will do is to take anything worth anything in your life out of your life until you learn how to rely on him. Do you think Elijah had an easy assignment? No one else would stand with you, so I'm the only one that has a bow to me. I'm, I'm, I'm taking on 450 prophets of Baal all by myself, man. I'm walking into the king's palace with a message that sounds ludicrous. Sounds like I lost my mind and God's given me this assignment. Why? Because God does not call weak Christians to tough places. <laughs> so don't get uptight, don't get nervous, but it's going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want to hear that. Boy, there goes the glasses. <laughs> that little screw, Mary, you, you gave me these glasses and they're defective. I've lost those. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. You think Moses had an easy assignment? Go down to those two and a half million rebellious people that want to do their own thing. You got ten of your twelve men that are already against you on your church board. They all got an evil report, and only two of the guys have a positive report. Why don't you go down there? They're divided, true. They don't get along. And then you got your, your brother's going to help you in this whole endeavor, and he's going to facilitate some kind of sexual orgy and worshiping a golden calf when you come up on the hill. Yeah, I just want you to take this charge because you're a weakling. No. He knew that Moses could do it. God does not call weak men and women to difficult assignments. Jeremiah, he said, I know that others wouldn't declare what you are called to declare, but the word I've given you must be shared. How about Paul the Apostle? Every city he went into, he had a revival or a riot. How many times was he shipwrecked? How many times was he beaten and stoned and left for dead. I mean, it's every time you turn around, he's bloodied up, beaten up, thrown in jail. Something's gone wrong. Do you think that was an easy assignment for the Apostle Paul? Anybody, listen to what I'm going to say to you this morning. Anybody who has ever done anything great for God has paid a great price. David said, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. If you, don't, if you want to be great for God, get ready to pay a great price. If you're not willing to pay a great price, don't expect to be great in the kingdom. Come on. Oh, I don't want to hear this, Pastor. This
this is not what I came to church for. How, how, how about you? Thank you, sir. Same pair. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Maybe this screw will be tighter here. I tried. I got a few screws loose. <laughs> how about Joe? Did Job have an easy life? Why did God consider Job? Because he was a man who was perfect. Makes you want to be perfect, doesn't it? If I'm perfect, God chooses me to suffer. Why does God take the quality people and put them through the ringer? And those cheapskates out there that aren't worth a plug nickel, he lets them get blessed. Because that's what the prophet didn't understand. But what he needed to know was this. It's not about them. It's about you. And things are going to get worse, son. So if you can't handle it now, what are you going to do when it gets a little worse? What are you going to do? If you can't run with the big dogs, you better stay on the porch. If you can't run with the big dogs, you better stay on the porch. What God was saying to him was, put your belly ache. I got a word for you today, and you may not think it's pleasant. Put your belly ache. The second word he gave him, it's time to toughen up. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible said, For when the time that you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You ought to be teaching others, but you haven't even learned the lessons yourselves yet. You, you, you have a long way to go to toughen up to be what you ought to be for me to use you for my Lord. You know, when you're training for an athletic competition, you push yourself to the limits of physical conditioning. Spiritual strength does not come without resistance. No pain, no gain. You see, at the time of Jeremiah, the king was a godly king whose name was Josiah. But he was about to die, and the new man that would replace him was Jehoiakim, who was an ungodly king. And here's what God's saying to Jeremiah. If you can't handle the pressure when you've got a man that's godly in power, what are you going to do when you have one that's ungodly in power? He said, what are you going to do with the swelling of the Jordan? The swelling of the Jordan refers to down at the banks of the Jordan River. There was an area that was overgrown with thickets and brush and trees and reeds. And there were lions that lived there. And he was saying, if you can't handle the pressure of life in the territory you're in where there's family and friends and godly leadership, where are you going to be in hostile territory? If you can't live for Jesus in America, how would you ever measure up in China? If you can't live this life here, let me tell you, there's always somebody worse off than you. If you think it can't get worse, it can. Did you, see, you hear what I just said? If you think it can't get worse, it can. If you can't stay awake in Gethsemane, how will you ever endure Calvary? And if you cannot endure the garden, how will you ever face God? God? If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That goes from Gethsemane to Golgotha to glory. You'll never get to glory without going through Golgotha, and you'll never endure Golgotha if you can't even endure Gethsemane. If you can't even stay awake, in a prayer meeting. How are you ever going to survive when 
and Satan unleashes everything he's got against you. Thank you. 